Hey, good morning. Say wow. Say it backwards. Okay, just testing you, just making sure you're still ready to go. Um, maybe some of you have not met me. I got to share with your church planters last spring. And you're looking and you're thinking, who's Dave Early? He looks like a very ordinary guy. That's why I brought some pictures of my family, because I found that if you're a very ordinary looking person, uh, having an attractive family. So you can see I have an attractive family, so maybe I might be worth listening to after all, right? Well, I was teaching at Liberty Baptist Theological Seminary several years ago. I was teaching a class, a uh, graduate class, I think, in church planting. We we're talking about the great promise where Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And I made one of those statements. I said, I really believe that if we would learn to partner with Jesus in planting churches, you can start a church anywhere and it would kick in the gates of hell. One of those uh, brass things that a professor sometimes said, and uh, God heard me. That moment I felt the Holy Spirit say to me, Dave, do you believe that? And I'm like, absolutely, I believe that. And uh, then God said, well, if that's what you believe, go find the gates of hell and start a church. So almost three years ago, we moved to Las Vegas, Nevada, and we picked the least churched zip codes of Las Vegas, Nevada. Uh, the area we are in is 122,000 people. About 2,000 people attended a Christian, non-Catholic uh, non-Jehovah's Witness, non-Mormon uh, church last Easter. That's 1.6%. That's an unreached people group according to Lifeway. So um, we are at a place called Sin City where obviously we lead in uh, all addictions, including gambling, sex, alcohol, drugs, uh, per capita homelessness. We can get girls direct to your door in 20 minutes or less. Uh, the T-shirt says, and uh, we're triple the national average in suicide. Today, I want to talk to you about spiritual warfare. Now, it was about, I was pastoring a church in Columbus, Ohio, and it was about 20 years ago when uh, God spoke to me uh, about the reality of spiritual warfare. Now, up until that time, I understood spiritual warfare from a theological point of view, a biblical point of view, an intellectual point of view. But one week, God showed me a very experiential understanding of spiritual warfare. I woke up on a Tuesday morning in great pain. I looked down and I found a big, large, red welt on my arm and then another and another. Realized I was covered with boils. Say, ouch. A boil is like an infected hair or an infected zit on steroids. And it's a big, painful, pussy thing. I went to the doctor. He examined me everywhere, Hot, top to bottom, uh, head to toe. Everything I'd eaten, every, everything I drank, everywhere I'd been. And then he did this. Look at me. He went, now I want you to know you don't want your doctor to go like that. <laughs> and I said, what? And he said, well, I got to be honest with you. In, in all my studies, I've never heard of anybody getting 22 boils overnight. He said, that just doesn't happen. It, it, I don't know that it's ever happened. And then he went, except in the book of Job. Now, he's a Christian. He said, uh, what are you preaching on Sunday? I said, well, I'm doing a new series on angels, demons, and spiritual warfare. He said, bingo. He said, this is what we're going to do. I'm going to give you some cream to kind of lessen your pain so that you can get some rest. And your wife needs to go home and call some people and get them to pray. Because my cream isn't going to get rid of your boils. And if they're not gone by Friday, and they won't be, I'm going to have to take the razor blade and lance each one. Say, ouch. 
Well, I went home. I, I told Kathy I went to bed. Kathy called some prayer warriors in our church. Went back Friday morning. He examined me again from head to toe, top to bottom, and then he did this again. He went, he said, I can't believe it. He said, they're gone. They're all gone. 22 boils are gone. He said, this must be quite a series you're going to be doing on spiritual warfare this week. Well, I did have a great introduction to my sermon on Sunday. Well, uh, at Liberty, I... uh, created a class called Strategic Prayer and Spiritual Warfare. And I don't have time to give you an entire semester worth of content in uh, 40 minutes, but I'm going to hit some highlights with you, and I'd like you to turn with me to Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. And in Ephesians chapter 6, we have Paul pretty much summarizing... um, what spiritual warfare is all about. This is the most comprehensive explanation we have in the New Testament. He's talked to the believers in Ephesus about their position in Christ, who they are in Christ, and then the last part of the book, he's talking about how to live that out in daily relationships. And then he crescendos with this amazing passage on spiritual warfare. He says, beginning in verse 10, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground and after you've done everything to stand. Stand firm, therefore, with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, the breastplate of righteousness in place, your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit which is the word of God, and pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for God's people. Well, out of this passage, I want to give you three big thoughts. Big thought number one, uh, you need to understand that the war, number one, is real. The war is real. Uh, Francis Schaeffer said, we're locked in a battle. It's not a friendly gentleman's discussion. It's a life and death conflict between the spiritual hosts of wickedness and those who claim the name of Christ. A.W. Tozer said, the idea that the world is a playground instead of a battleground has now been accepted in practice by the vast majority of Christians. C.S. Lewis said, there's no neutral ground in the universe. Every square inch, every split second is claimed by God and counterclaimed by Satan. John Eldridge said, there are three eternal truths. Things are not what they seem. The world is at war, and each of us has a crucial role to play. The story of your life is a story of a long and brutal assault on your heart by the one who knows what you could be and fears it. Rick Warren said, if you're in the ministry, you're going to face opposition from the devil. He's opposed to everything you stand for. He hates anybody who's sold out to Jesus Christ. He will do anything he can to defeat you. Every Christian who wants to make a difference, according to Stu Weber, for Christ can count on living in the crosshairs of the enemy. Friends, we are in a war, and it's very real. Now, it hit me just uh, while I was reading that, that we haven't really uh, paused to pray in the last few minutes. And because of the subject we're talking about, I'd like us to pray. So uh, would you do this? Would you just stand for a second? And just put your hand on somebody nearby you, if you don't mind, and just ask God to bless them and open up their minds as we talk about this subject right now. So just uh, if you want to pray quietly or out loud, ask God to bless them and open up their minds as we talk about this subject right now.
Father, we are living in a place with a lot of avenues for the enemy. Between Mormonism and Islam, and Wicca and New Age and some of the Native American religions, God. Lord, we ask you, Holy Spirit, be our teacher. Make our minds clear. Help us hear what you have to say to us today. Be the God of hope, peace, and all encouragement. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. In Ephesians 6, he makes this statement. He says, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Our struggle is not against flesh and blood. I want you to notice he doesn't say my struggle or I wrestle. He says we. We are all in this battle. We are all in this battle. It's not just for someone somewhere else. Spiritual warfare is for you and I. It's for here and now. Satan has a plan for your life and it is to destroy you. When every baby is born, Satan's plan is to do everything possible to keep that child from coming to Christ. But after you come to Christ, the war is over, right? Not at all. Then he works that much harder to keep us from being effective in helping other people find Jesus Christ. C.S. Lewis wrote a famous book called The Screwtape Letters about spiritual warfare, and he spends one chapter on the man's life prior to Christ and the attack of the enemy up until salvation, and 30 chapters about the war that he faces after he's born again. This is a war that we face. We are in a war. We are the battleground. The second thing Uh, The second big truth I want you to see is this. The war is against the devices of the devil. The war is against the devices of the devil. It says, put on the whole armor of God so that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. The wiles, the schemes, the devices. 2 Corinthians 2.11, lest Satan should take advantage of us for we are not ignorant of his devices. It's helpful to know how your enemy likes to attack you. And the the clearest way to understand his devices is to understand his nature because everything he does comes out of his nature. And the easiest way to understand the nature of our enemy is to understand his names. So from the common names of the enemy, we're going to see the common devices of the devil. The first name of the enemy is Satan. And the first device is opposition. The word Satan means opposer or adversary. So when you read the word Satan, when you read the word uh, uh, Satan in the Bible, you're reading the word adversary, you're reading the word opposer. Paul writes in 1 Thessalonians 2.18, Therefore we wanted to come to you, even Paul, time and time again, but Satan Opposed, he hindered us. The opposer hindered us. We moved to Las Vegas less than three years ago. And uh, we started in my house and then we grew into a middle school auditorium and then a middle school cafeteria where we were renting uh, this public school on the weekends. Uh, In January, we got a phone call at 4.30 on Friday afternoon saying, I'm sorry, your paperwork uh, is not accurate. Uh, we've got to uh, act on this, and so you cannot meet in the school on Sunday morning. Now, it would have been nice. They knew it all week that the paperwork was inaccurate. Actually, they had made the mistake. But they waited till 4.30 on Friday to tell us where we would have no options of anywhere else uh, to go or we couldn't get the paperwork corrected. The enemy was opposing us. Brand new church, just started, just getting rolling, and now we're facing opposition. We happened to be in 21 days of prayer, the first 21 days of that January, And as we were praying, we had a prayer meeting that night 
we prayed about, God, where are we going to meet? What are we going to do? And we felt like God wanted us to go to a park. We'd had some outreaches in a park. Now, doing uh, uh, something in a park in January in Las Vegas is a little dicey. You don't know what type of weather you're going to have. It could be 60 and sunny. It could be 48 and rainy. The forecast said 48 and rainy. In fact, it started raining on Friday night and rained all day Saturday. A group of us went down to the park in a pavilion, and we stood there, and we just asked God. We said, God, the rain has got to stop. The sun has got to come out, and the wind has got to blow, but not too strong in order to dry up the grass so that we can have church in the park on Sunday. I got a question for you, and uh, I'm a professor, so I'm going to give you a quiz, but I'm a nice professor. I'm going to give you a study guide. Here's the study guide. The answer is big enough. Say it. Okay, here's the, here's the quiz. How big is God? Big enough. enough. What well, just so happened that sometime Saturday night, Sunday morning, the rain stopped, The wind started blowing, and Sunday morning when we got to the park and began to set up, the sun came out. How big is God? Big enough. enough. It also so happened that a reporter from the Las Vegas Weekly had heard about our church, some of the unique ministry we were doing with the homeless, and uh, some of the outreach we had that was impacting atheists and college students. And he came to write an article on us, and uh, being an atheist, and somebody had never been in church, it really, he loved the idea of church in the park. We had a big block party afterwards and, and fed a bunch of people. We did church in the park. And what's amazing is... Uh, I gave the gospel very clearly that day, and several people were born again. And what's awesome is in this article he wrote for the Las Vegas Weekly, which went to 387,000 people, he quoted me and said, this guy's in the park, and then he said, Jesus loves you, and and, uh, God created you, and God wants to have a relationship with you, and Jesus loves you, and he died for you, and if, if, if you will allow Jesus to change your life and put faith in him, You can have eternal life. He put the gospel in the article. How big is God? Big enough. Big enough. Look, I want to encourage you. You found out that when you step up into ministry, the target on your back gets bigger, doesn't it? When you start going after lost people, the target on your back gets bigger, doesn't it? And you're going to face opposition. Opposition, I've learned that that means I'm heading in the right direction. If I've got no opposition, I'm probably not heading in the right direction. But be encouraged because uh, our enemy is strong and he's smart. But understand this, how big is God? Big enough. Satan's an opposer. He's an adversary. Second name of the enemy I want to give you is accuser. His device is accusation. The word devil, when you say the word devil in Greek, you are saying the word slanderer or accuser or one who trips up uh, with his mouth. Now, what happens all the time is Satan is constantly throwing out accusations. First of all, and I don't fully understand this, he accuses us to God just like he accused Job to God when God said, have you seen my servant Job? What a great guy. And Satan said, he's not that great. If you take away his blessings, he won't serve you. Uh, Second, the devil accuses God to you. He tells you God is not good. He tells you God is not powerful. He tells you the Bible is not the word of God. He tells you Christianity is not the only way. He accuses God to you. We see this in Genesis 3, where the devil tells uh, Eve that God will not keep his promises. God is not going to keep his word. God cannot be trusted. He accuses God to you. I know even in this room, people that have been believers a long time, it would amaze us, some of us, if we realized some of the thoughts that have gone through our heads about, about how God loves everybody, but God doesn't love me as much as everybody else. 
God, doesn't, God keeps his word, but God doesn't always keep his word when it relates to me. Uh, the third accusation Satan makes is he accuses you to other people. That means he tells other people bad things about you. I didn't understand this. I was pastoring our church uh, that, that we started in Ohio. And um, on Monday night, I used to call people. It was my call night. And I, I was calling a lady that I hadn't seen in a while. And I said, hey, Jenny, I haven't seen you in a while. Where, I, we've missed you. And she said, no, you haven't. I said, yeah, we have. That's why I called you. She said, you haven't missed me. She said, you don't like me. In fact, you, I said, no, we, we want to see you on Sunday. She said, you don't want to see me on Sunday. You don't like me. You don't want me to be a part of your church. She said, in fact, last time you were there, last time I was there, I could tell you hate me. I said, you've got to be kidding. What gave you that idea? She said, the whole time you were speaking, you stared directly at me. And I could read your eyes. You were saying through your eyes you hated me and you didn't want me to come back. I said, Jenny, there were about 800 people there that day. I, I, you were sitting in the back uh, and I can't even see your eyes. I said, where do you think those thoughts come from? I said, this is the honest truth. Before I called you, Kathy said, who are you calling tonight? And I said, well, the first person I want to call is Jenny because I haven't seen her in a while, and I miss her. And we were talking about how much we love you and how proud we are of you as a single mom raising your daughter for the Lord. I said, Not, this is the truth. Never once in my life have I thought I don't like you. And if we didn't want you to be part of our church family, I wouldn't have called you. Where did those thoughts come from? She said, the devil. I said, do you think? He's an accuser. He not only accuses uh, other, you to other people, he accuses other people to you. He tells you bad things about other people. Kathy and I were just uh, fairly newly married, and we had a discussion. How many of you are married and you know what I mean by a discussion? It's one of those discussions where she ended up in the kitchen banging things and I ended up in the garage banging things. And the whole time I'm banging things, I'm thinking these thoughts. Bad wife. Bad, bad wife. She doesn't love you. She, she, she doesn't. Uh, she wishes she'd never married you. She wishes you were dead. And I'm thinking, bad wife, bad, bad wife. And these thoughts are going around in my head. And next thing I know, the door between the kitchen and the garage opens. And there's Kathy. And she's got a tear in her cheek. And she said, honey, I love you. I said, you do? She said, yes. And I said, you don't want to divorce me? She said, no. I said, you don't want me dead? She said, what are you talking about? She said, I'm sorry, I don't even know what we were arguing about. Come on back in. I fixed you some cookies. Where did those thoughts come from? The accuser. The, third, uh, the, la the fifth accusation that he loves to make is he loves to accuse you to yourself. He's constantly accusing you to yourself, telling you bad things about yourself. So many Christians are handicapped in ever sharing their faith or ever uh, giving leadership, ever becoming all they can be for God because they just constantly hear these accusations in their head that they are not good enough. They can't do it. They won't do it. Understand that comes from the enemy. The truth is without Jesus, there's a lot of stuff I can't do, but in Christ, I can do what? All things. Everything God asks of me to do, I can do through Christ. Remember, Satan is an accuser. Number three, he's a tempter. He's going to tempt us. The first time we see the Bible is in Genesis, uh, see the, the devil in the Bible is in Genesis 3, where he's tempting Eve. Uh, the first time Jesus encounters Satan, he's tempting Jesus in the wilderness. Remember, he is a tempter. Now, he knows your buttons, and he knows how to tempt you, and he knows when to tempt you. 
He's a tempter. And understand this. At e for most of us, it's either when you're doing really well or when things are really hard. That's when the temptation increases. You need to know yourself. You need to know your adversary. And you need to know when he's going to tempt you. And be prepared. For temptation. Number four, he's a deceiver. He loves to lie. It's his very nature. He's called the deceiver in Revelation chapter 12, John 8, 44. He's called the father of lies. It says that it's his native language, is lying. There's no truth in him. Look, if I, if I had the ability to print out every thought you've thought in the last week, and go through and highlight every lie that you have accepted as truth, I can find every area of your life where you experience bondage. Jesus said you will know the truth, and the truth will what? Set you free, which means, and, and the word there means to experience truth. So every area of my life where I experience truth, I experience freedom, but the same is true. Every area where I experience lies is where I experience bondage. I live in the, uh, the 96th out of 100 least biblical-minded city in America. And I live in what's got to be uh, one of the, if not the, most bondage-filled city in America. People are, are in such bondage to depression, fear, anxiety, anger, guilt, shame, so many addictions... Satan is a deceiver. We've got to learn the truth because the truth sets us free. Uh, the last one I want to give you out of his nature is destruction. He's a destroyer. He's a destroyer. And um, it says, for example, Ephesians 6, take up the, the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. There's lots of ways Satan likes to bring destruction to us. One is he just wants to to, to hit us with an arrow of discouragement, an arrow of despair, an arrow of depression. And, and the damage isn't done by the arrow. The damage is done by the flames. It, it hits. And if we accept that, that, that discouraging, that despairing, that depressing thought, it begins to burn and expand and continue. Um, I don't want you to raise your hand, but I want you to look at me for a second. I wonder how many of you have had this this, this download dump in your mind of discouragement and depression, even to the point of wondering if you should take your own life. I was training a bunch of missionaries. Um, we were in a, uh, an Islamic country, and these were missionaries to, to the, the hardest people on the planet in some ways, Hindus, Muslims, and Buddhists, the least reached. And I asked them this question, I said, how many of you, when you got to your mission field, began to wake up around 3, 3.30 at night with overwhelming sense of anxiety and depression? An overwhelming download of anxious, depressing thoughts. And people began to cry around the room. What was interesting is they thought they were the only one. Look, I train church planters all over, and uh, so many times I'll say, when did you get to where you're planting your church? You get these overwhelmingly negative thoughts. Satan loves to be a destroyer. I live in the suicide capital of America. I want you to know, <laughs> uh, thank God for the, the worship uh, band. We can put on the garment of praise to replace the spirit of heaviness. I've learned to fight back with thanksgiving. I enter his gates with thanksgiving. I go deeper into his courts with praise. And if you're getting hit in the middle of the night with a bunch of depression, you need to have learned some things and just go through your list of, of, of thanksgiving in Christ. All right, well, let's talk uh, now about the last thing I wanted to give you, and that is that this war is winnable. 
The war is winnable. You don't have to live in discouragement. We don't have to live in frustration. The war is winnable. It says in 2 Corinthians 10, 5, the weapons of our warfare are powerful through God to the demolition of strongholds. I love demolition, just just completely levels the strongholds of the enemy. Let me give you a couple uh, very simple weapons of our warfare. Number one is our identity in Christ. Our identity in Christ. Again and again in Ephesians 6, it says, stand strong, stand in the Lord. Put on the whole armor of God so that you can stand. Having done all in the day of evil, in the day of temptation, the day of attack, stand your ground. You say, what do I stand in? I stand in the victory Jesus already won for me at the cross and resurrection. I'm on victory ground. I have a place of standing. I have an awesome identity in Jesus Christ. You know, the problem with the church today is we don't know who we are. And so as John Eldridge says, the enemy knows who we could be and fears us. We're afraid of the enemy when we need to know who we are. The enemy should be afraid of us. Very simple verse we all know, 1 John 4, 4. Little children, you are from God and have overcome them. For he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. How big is God? Big enough. Now, my kids are little. I learned a lot from that great theologian, Robin Williams. Remember him? One of my favorite movies, you know, you got a little kid, you got to watch the movie over and over and over again, was Aladdin. And in Aladdin, there's this scene where uh, the genie is introducing himself to Aladdin and all that he can do. And basically, the genie is explaining uh, all the potential that is available in this lamp. And, And he comes to a point and he says, phenomenal cosmic powers. Itty bitty living space. Hey, I'm five foot six and I weigh 152 pounds. And you better watch out. Because greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. I've got awesome, cosmic, phenomenal power. Itty bitty living space. You know, if you understood who you were in Jesus, you'd get up tomorrow morning and look in the mirror and go, mm hmm. Yeah. Yeah, baby, that's what I'm talking about. Um, You know, we're sons of the Most High God, sons and daughters of the Most High God. We have the same authority at the throne of God as Jesus because we are in Jesus, and we are the sons and daughters of the Most High God. We are saints. The word saint means holy. That means I don't need to sin. What a sinner have to sin. I'm a saint. I've been made holy through the blood of Jesus Christ. You can live above temptation if you know who you are in Jesus. Uh, I love Romans 8, 38. It says, no, in all these things, every type of adversity you can face, in all these things, we are more than victorious through him who loved us. We are more than conquerors, more than, uh, in the Greek, who pair, which means super. Look at me for a second. I want you to know that in Jesus Christ, you and I are super conquerors through him who loved us. You better watch out. That's our identity. Second, uh, we need to use the weapon of reconciliation. Reconciliation. Uh, That's making things right. 2 Corinthians was written to right a wrong where it says that we may not be taken advantage of by Satan for we are not ignorant of his schemes. If we don't forgive, if we don't learn to practice peacemaking, the enemy will take us in through his devices. The third one is the word of God. The word of God, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Uh, I was uh, just... uh, a young pastor in Ohio, and I got a phone call one Wednesday night. We had a house group at our house and just put the kids in bed, just got everybody out of the house. And I got a phone call from a pastor friend of mine, Pastor Vic, and he said, hey, I got a lady in my church. She's suicidal. She's delusional. Can you help us? And I said, well, sure. Is there anything else? He said, yeah, there's something else. And I said, what is it? And he said, well, can you help us? 
And I said, okay. I said, when do you want to go tomorrow? And he said, well, actually, I'm in your driveway. We got to go tonight. This is desperate. He picked me up. Pastor Paul, his, his uh, associate pastor, uh, Paul, Pastor Vic, picked me up. We drove across town to this little hospital on the other side of Columbus, Ohio. We went up to the top floor. In the, the room was this little grandma in bed with her daughter and her son-in-law. Now, Grandma had been delusional. She had been suicidal. They were very worried about her, and she was not a believer. Pastor Vic tried to share the gospel with her, and uh, she just he got a blank screen. He looked at me like, what do I do? I said, let me try something. I got down in her face, and I said, please repeat after me, Jesus Christ is Lord. Grandma tensed up every muscle in her body. And I I said, I want you to repeat after me. I am washed in the blood of Jesus. She tensed up. Her lips curled. She snarled. And out of her mouth, in a male voice, Grandma began to cuss me out. The next hour was very interesting. Part of the time, we allowed the demon to manifest so we could figure out why uh, the demon was there. Part of the time, we shut it up so we could talk to Grandma. Uh, it was loud. It was, it was uh, kind of crazy. Got this male voice, deep, loud male voice, demon, uh, vulgarly addressing us. Hospital staff is pretty freaked out. It's really late at night. I said, look, I, I'm afraid grandma's worn out. I said, we need to um, bring this to a close tonight. I said, let's come back in the morning and finish this. I am uh, doing a pastoral visit, so I did the pastoral thing. I had my Bible in my hand. I took Grandma's hand. I leaned out over Grandma to pray, and Grandma tensed up and reared up, and in that demon voice said, Get the knives out of here! I said, What are you talking about? There's no knives in this place. There are knives all over this place. I said, There are no knives in this place. This is a hospital room. I said, how many knives are in this room? Four. Five knives. Five knives. And I looked. I had a Bible. Pastor Paul had a Bible. Pastor Vic had a Bible. Daughter had a Bible. Son-in-law had a Bible. Five Bibles. We're supposed to take up the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. If I ever doubted the authority of Scripture, my doubting of the authority of Scripture was over. you got to understand, in Christ, who you are in Christ makes demons tremble. you got to understand, this book that God has given us makes demons tremble. We went down in the car, and I said what you sometimes say after an unusual pastoral visit. I said, that was an unusual pastoral visit. (laughs) Now, listen to me very, very carefully. I want you to hear. Pastor Paul said, you know what really made that unusual? Grandma is legally blind. Legally blind. Now, you think about what I told you. That's how powerful God and his word is. Look, we do not have to be on the defensive. We're supposed to be kicking down the gates of hell, not running from the gates of hell. The last weapon we have is prayer. It says all this crescendos in verse 18 where it says praying with all kinds of prayer in the spirit on all occasions. Stay alert in prayer. 1 Peter 5 uh, verse 6 through 8 it says humble yourselves under God's mighty hand that he may lift you up. Cast all your anxiety on him for he cares for you. You know, my life changed as a church planter. It used to be hell in my house every Saturday night. The kids would throw up. The kids were sick. Kathy and I would have discussions. I would have nightmares every Saturday night, especially if it was going to be a Sunday where we were sharing the gospel. I taught my church. I said, look, I need you to pray for me. I humbled myself. I said, I need you to pray for me. I need you to pray for my family. I need you to pray for the other pastors. Uh, Pray for us all week, but especially Saturday night, the first Saturday night that our church prayed for us. I woke up the next Sunday, and it was the first Sunday in like five years that I had not, that I had a whole night's sleep. 
Look, we have untapped resources in prayer. Never underestimate the power of prayer and spiritual warfare. It is a battle that we fight best on our knees. Would you bow your heads? Would you bow your heads? God, I know beyond a shadow of a doubt there are people in this room. When I mentioned uh, the challenge of uh, depression, despair, anxiety, suicidal thoughts, that there were people in this room struggling. God, I ask in the strong name of Jesus, Holy Spirit of God, encourage them right now. And God, help them take steps so they can walk in freedom. God, I know that there are pastors and church planters and pastors' wives who are discouraged here today. And God, I ask in the name of Jesus, you'd be indeed the God of all encouragement, the God of all hope, the God of all peace. God, I thank you that we're not in this war alone and that we are not uh, fighting from a place of disadvantage, that we do not have inferior weapons. God, I thank you that in the name of Jesus, we are more than conquerors. We are super conquerors through him who loves us. God, I pray for this uh, convention that we be a people who band together one another, praying for one another, standing together so that we can walk forward in victory and march on and take this state for the glory of God. We can advance the kingdom of God in New Mexico, and we can bring salvation, healing, deliverance to thousands of people that indeed every single person in New Mexico would have an opportunity to come to Jesus Christ in a powerful way. God, we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray.